genocide as we mark it, that one of the steps that we want to avoid and is part of the genocide is the denial. Is the denial of something that is incumbent and something that is uh, taking place in order to uh, take out the, the problem of, uh, of, 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 of addressing the matter. And one of the issues here, and I think that the whole work of uh, uh, Professor Zoya regarding the paranoia is also part of it. I mean, part of the paranoia is the recognition of uh, uh, not even willing to address the paranoia itself. And uh, I think that I would really like him to address this question. And then if there is any on, on other person in the panel that wants to address, uh, I would uh, give the floor. Well, it's a uh, very, very hard question. <laughs> uh, let me say that, uh, at least looking retrospectively, you can certainly see the difference one um, in, in visions between, for instance, uh, Mussolini and Hitler. Not to <laughs> be mild uh, uh, in front of fascism, but just uh, seeing the uh, temperamental uh, uh, difference. Uh, uh, one reflected in the personality of the leader and hence in his politics to simply achieve power, very cynically, but to achieve power. In the other, having an agenda which is paranoid and you can recognize uh, beforehand in, uh, in the writings. I mean, um, another possibility I see is, for instance, knowing a little bit uh, uh, South American countries which have gone through military dictatorships in the 70s and in the 80s uh, as uh, um, Mostly they had just the repressive characters, but some, like Argentina, had also as partly an agenda which was uh, persecutory um, from the beginning on. So I, I see, uh, <laughs> I mean, my contribution can only go in this direction. And another little hint I would make, um, I would go back to the responsibility of mass media um, uh, to recall what uh, um, I have found in India, I mean, with the help of uh, a person who is a, a leading psychoanalyst there uh, and has written about uh, ethnic uh, riots in a basically multi ethnic state like India, that uh, in comparison uh, with uh, uh, 47 with the partition between India and Pakistan. Uh, at the beginning, there were ethnic riots on a local basis and a lot of bad information. Nowadays, there is much more and better information, and anyhow, television and uh, uh, how do you say, real time media reach each village, and the information is much better because it's usually the Indian state television uh, informing about ethnic riot and condemning them. But nevertheless, there is still a possibility of collective uh, psychological infection, namely that learning it through the mass media, a lot of prejudice restarts immediately. So the good message does not exclude uh, the bad message, or even in a highly civilized and uh, elaborated society like the Norwegian, you can see that after the uh, crazy attack of uh, Anders Breivik, uh, the, um, how do you say, internet uh, um, uh, websites of Islamic uh, uh, Muslim organization get many more hate messages than they did before, in spite of everything having been done. So uh, there is a, a really psychopathological possibility which one should address immediately. And this is why I have uh, uh, been happy to, as a, a professional, say, of a psychoanalytic side, to have been included in this uh, all political, institutional uh, uh, 
interventions tend to be not enough uh, in front of the uh, refusal of every human to see the potential in his, uh, in his uh, own soul. But I think that I, I don't know if I've misunderstood your question, but I think also your question was also referring to the difficulty to apply a notion that of genocide, which has been envisaged, as I said, from a criminal law perspective with a preventative role, and the difficulty to prevent at the mass level, collective level, something when genocide has not occurred in ordinary meaning. And I think the very and Lemkin must be very happy in the sense that it's been successful. Whenever we speak of genocide, we immediately think of something which involves the destruction of a group. But I insist that the criminal law definition does not want to have destruction to be attained before calling it genocide, something genocide. So my point of view is that, again, we should separate the criminal law perspective, which could play an important role in the preventative function of genocide in the sense of destruction of the group actually taking place if we really are ready to exercise the jurisdiction and so on and so forth but then we have might be ready at the diplomatic and international level to accept that at the state level genocide is something else that this should be describing something else otherwise you are catching the problem with the ICJ International Court of Justice was confronting to say, okay, there are all the committee for the of who I don't want to now to be, give labels, but in front of mass killings, how many should die before calling it genocide at the collective level? And then the explanation, well, but it's an armed conflict, it's economic problems, and you want to have the proof to call some state action as genocide, that the true objective is only that of the destruction. But as we know, mass destruction is only coupled with other objectives. Always. At the criminal law level, special intent is something. At the state level, can we, since the consequences are not so serious, because after all, to call something as mass killing or genocide of crimes against humanity does not change much at the level of the consequences. Are we ready to find a new definition or to call <laughs> genocide at the state level to be something different from what is written here in criminal law textbook? I think that that's the origin of the problem. Sorry. Uh, just a quick comment. Um, another, besides Roman Blair, who's a well-known Canadian working on particularly uh, for the Baha'i and, and Jesse Gretchen, I have another um, uh, co-citizen, Erwin Kotler, uh, who was written since the genocide prevention, and he um, he states clearly that genocide begins with words, um, and I think that's one of the issues that we've been responding to killing, but not to the words. Um, and that's where R2P comes in, those early warning signs. And what, one thing my institute does to contribute to that is we do have an, um, a media monitoring project where we monitor 15 states at risk that we believe are risk of genocide or, or, or atrocity-like crimes. And we monitor the domestic media to see what the state is saying or not saying. And when we find any warning signs, we share that with different UN offices, uh, people in the main government and other think tanks across the world. So I think we have to focus more at, uh, uh, observing the media, particularly now it's social media, because so much is being used at a pace that we have no idea how much human labor is needed to, to monitor that. But I think that's really where we have to be concentrating now to, to take early action. So it is really my uh, Bertie. You wanted to? Uh, it is now my uh, privilege to welcome Nancy to the panel. She's been hearing what we would have said instead of Lemkin, but uh, she was among the ones that met with him, worked with him, lived with him, had personal life and personal experience together. Uh, she met Rafael Lemkin in the spring of 58. She has an amazing history in her life. She, she was uh, uh, an assistant uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. student in, in Columbia University at the International House before, and then uh, she's been working with the delegation of Iraq uh, for some time, and uh, in the mean of, of that, she met with, uh, uh, with this incredible person that was Rafael Lemkin. And uh, she had the possibility to assist him really in the, in the phases of uh, uh, the late part of his life. Uh, and uh, more, she, thanks to him, was convinced to pursue also one of her goals that is now her life, that is art. And uh, she became an artist. Uh, she crafts metal and uh, she has a, a beautiful art, artwork. Uh, she also made a statue or, or a figure, uh, for example, in Raphael Lemkin's life and legacy. And, uh, well, thank you, Nancy, in advance. Uh, I think that uh, you will triggered us all about uh, the life of like him, what actually he would have said and what actually what he did say in his life. Thank you very much. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome to everyone here for this really very, very important issue. Dr. Lampton would be so thrilled to know that we're still working on this problem and probably will be for many years to come. Um, I would like to um, especially thank Enzo Savini and Mr. Um, for your perseverance in bringing this Center into me. He worked very hard on it. I would like to introduce myself to you as Nancy Steinson Ehrlich. Now that happened because in 1979 I married Bernard Ehrlich, a native of Vienna. He came to the United States in 1939. We were married for 30 years. So and he was also a refugee. So I learned a lot from him uh, about refugees, about what it's like to be forced out of your own country. Um, he once said, I'd like to introduce a little levity here. He once said uh, to many friends, he had a great sense of humor. He said, I had a meeting with Hitler. And I said to him, either you go or I go. <laughs> well, he, he went. <laughs> he would be thrilled that I'm here today to tell you about Dr. Lemkin, whom he had never met. I'd also like to introduce my brother, Dr. William Ackerley, who has supported my efforts to perpetuate Dr. Lemkin's memory for over 50 years. So thank you, William, from the bottom of my heart. I first met Dr. Lemkin in New York in the spring of 58, he said. I was 23 years old. We were, I was having a picnic lunch in Riverside Park, if any of you know the great park along the Hudson River, with a student and I had been working at International House with the uh, resident, uh, assistant to the resident student advisor. So I was having a picnic lunch with a student from Kerala, India. And this elderly gentleman walks by as we were having lunch. He's kind of stooped over, his hands behind his back, very Euro style, as we say in America, tie everything. <laughs> and he stopped and he said, uh, with a heavy European accent, I know the words for I love you in 20 languages. <laughs> we were shocked. <laughs> he said, May I join you? And we said, of course. We were delighted and said, just please tell us, tell us. He 
then told us he was the author of the UN Convention on the Crime and Punishment of Genocide, and we were enthralled. He seemed gentle, sweet, and very kind. Thereafter, we became close friends. We visit each other in our apartments. We take strolls in the park, at Riverside Park. We go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art together, have lunch, look at the works. And uh, conversations in cafes and dinners with friends. And my friendship lasted a year and a half, you have to understand. That's all about it. But when I went to his apartment, I found out he had only one room, no private bathroom of his own. I think it was down the hall somewhere. No phone, only a table with an old typewriter, bookcases, and a day bed. Papers and books were just piled everywhere, but he knew where everything was, <laughs> as people like that sometimes do. So we had many discussions. One of them mainly was about his early life in Poland. He was born on a farm in eastern Poland, and especially about his mother, Bella, who was his tutor. We say, in the United States anyway, that's, that the mother or the parents homeschooled the children. And so that's, his mother obviously introduced many classics of world literature to her children. The primary one, excuse me, was, was the book Quo Vadis, which I'm sure many of you know. That made the greatest, and that was the novelist Sienkiewicz, the famous writer. That made the greatest impression on him. It speaks of the slaughter of the Christians in the Roman Colosseum 2,000 years ago. Meaning, aren't you going to the Colosseum to watch? <laughs> and he said to his mother, where were the police? And she said, well, there weren't any. And he said, why not? She said, Raphael, when you grow up, you'll have to answer those questions for yourself. He said, that day was the beginning of my crusade against genocide, as I began looking for the answer. Then we talked about racism. And I think this was one of the things brought us together, because I was born in Kentucky, in the southern part of the United States, was quite involved with the civil rights movement. Um, I couldn't understand the amount of prejudice against the American black. It, it just didn't make sense to me. And it, with my introduction to genocide through Dr. Lemkin, I realized that prejudice is a precursor to genocide. It, it may be one of them, but it certainly is a very big one. And with the languages that he, obviously someone said he, he learned 10 languages. Philology, he began studying, I think, the University of Rufov. Polish University, he studied that in the beginning, including Arabic and Sanskrit. So this is a great example and evidence of his extreme intelligence. His knowledge of the importance of language and understanding cultures helped him at the United Nations. He was so often able to speak to people in their own language. He also explained to me something that I really was fascinated with. He said, I tried to speak into a person, not at a person. So he tried to get into their inner self as he was trying to win the support for the convention. Then, the, as you know, and was mentioned before, cultural genocide was his most passionate concern. It was to save the cultures of the world. He once said to me that killing one person is terrible, but to kill a culture is a crime of another magnitude. He was truly a Renaissance man. He loved painting, sculpture, all forms of art, especially poetry, music, literature, and was well informed in all of them. Now at the time, I wanted to be like him. 
and even took what we call in the United States LSAT exams, which tests a student's aptitude for the law. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll take that exam. And thinking of him as a mentor and father figure, as I've always called him Dr. Lemkin, uh, I told him I didn't do too badly on that test, Dr. Lemkin. And he said, I somehow see you as an artist. <laughs> he was very sensitive to other people's feelings, and uh, he just said it very, I never forgot, but he said it very in a kind way. But some people have told me that he himself, someone asked him when he retired, what would he like to do, and he said he wanted to resume his paintings. So he also uh, had done some paintings at some point in his life. And as many of you know, there's a, we had a mutual friend, uh, Phyllis Kotite, uh, an, uh, an American of Lebanese descent, who now lives in Paris, whom some of you know. She was working at the UN at that time and was very helpful to Dr. Lumpkin. She has recently spoken to me, and we've spoken by phone uh, from New York to Paris. It was wonderful about whether or not Dr. Lemkin knew Doug Hammerschold. She mentioned his book, Markings, which reveals his universalism and humanitarianism. They both were of similar caliber, also a similar time of life. And we wondered together recently if they had been friends. Some of you might know the answer. I'm sorry that she couldn't be with us today. Regarding marriage, I asked Dr. Lumpkin several months into our friendship if he ever wanted to be married. He was very clear about it. I have no time for a wife and family. <laughs> he had one mission only, as you know, and to that he was totally dedicated. He had, I'm sure, a lot of loneliness and pain due to that aloneness. But he never, and he was also the fault quite destitute towards the end, which he never displayed. He always maintained a dignity worthy of his importance to the world, which I'm sure he questioned many times as he confronted his difficulties, both professional and personal. Two books were given to me by Dr. Lefty. My question to this day has been why my feelings are that these two books reveal his inner, deepest inner life and philosophy, perhaps being a bit of a mystic himself. It may be the only evidence of it. The first book, as many of you may know, was Cosmic Consciousness, a classic investigation of the development of man's mystic relation to the infinite which was written by a Canadian medical doctor, Dr. Richard Buck, um, published in 1901. I'm sure um, that this was true of Dr. Lenkin's early life, that uh, Dr. Buck believed that Gautama the Buddha was a case of cosmic consciousness. And uh, due to the initial, he talked about the initial character of a person's mind as, as a youth or in their youth. And I'm sure this could apply to many of you. <coughs> Dr. Buck, of course, enumerates a number of other characteristics as he examined the lives of many well known and unknown persons to speak of this concept. He was the first person who ever mentioned cosmic consciousness to me. I mean, I, I was just astounded and fascinated. He gave me the book toward the beginning of our friendship, which I was able to understand more fully as I matured. I happened to show him a photograph of my father, to which he said, he has cosmic consciousness. So perhaps it takes one to recognize one. <laughs> the second was a book entitled His Last Friendship. It was published in 1957 and edited by Marcel Raval about the great Czech poet, Rainer Maria Rilke. Dr. Lenkin obviously felt a deep kinship with this man. As he read the book, annotated it, underlined it, 
and uh, writing in the margins his own responses, re-emphasizing phrases that he related to all in his red pencil. If he came across a phrase that he really liked, he would put two big vertical you know, marks down the side. And uh, he wrote again, he kind of wrote out again some of the, some of the phrases that Rilke used, and one of them was that Rilke, in his poetry, had created a new cosmos of the soul. I remember he gave me that book shortly before he died. And I've always hoped that he meant the title to refer to our friendship. There are three short quotes I'd like to read to you from those books, from that particular book, a real piece book. The one, first one, is, in quotes, it is this admirable, this immortal instinct for beauty which enables us to consider the earth and its spectacles as a glimpse of, as consonant with heaven. The insatiable thirst for everything which is beyond, the most living proof of our immortality. It is both through poetry, through and beyond music, that the soul catches a glimpse of the splendors beyond the grave. You have to imagine all of this is undermined by him. The second one, in all things, really he encountered the ennobling, exquisite, rending experience of the divine. Dr. Lincoln writes in the lower margin on the same page, what is bigger than the normal man? Interesting, don't you think? So all of us are mystics in our own way. <laughs> life and death were the, in quotes, life and death were the reverse and the obverse of the same phenomenon. Past, present, and future were one for him and all the proofs that our appearances as living creatures is inseparable from the presence of the departed were precious to him. And then Dr. Lemkin circles the word medium. Did he recognize that quality in Rilke as something he understood himself? I was, just to talk a little bit about assisting him <clears throat> with his autobiography in Spring Valley, New York in the summer of 1959. He asked me to help him smooth out the language, so which I tried to do. While with him, I noticed he was taking small white pills. Like, what are they? I didn't want to ask, you know, I wanted to be polite. They were nitroglycerin tablets. He had a severe heart disease, had been unable to receive needed medical care, had little money, couldn't even see doctors because he had no, no funds for that. But we know he carried on valiantly until the end. He'd gone into New York to visit a publisher, we were told, and he felt comfortable with his friends in Spring Valley that summer. They had also come from Eastern Poland. He would speak Polish and Yiddish with them, tell jokes, and relax. I had to leave Spring Valley in mid-August for a few days. And as I got onto the bus, he said to me, hurry back. I watched him walk away through the bus window, and in a letter I wrote to him a few days later, I said I felt his walk was the walk of a lifetime, an unconscious premonition, perhaps. He suffered a massive heart attack on the streets of New York a few days later. My friendship with Dr. Lemkin was the highlight of my early life. He opened up the world to me. It's been a great honor to participate in this memorable occasion. And I know he would welcome wholeheartedly the Budapest Center focus and emphasis on the prevention of genocide, as well as the work of the UN on this issue. He would also be very concerned about the internal conflicts that exists today on different continents. I'm pleased the ICC is addressing the legal accountability of crimes committed against humanity that he initiated in the convention. In closing, I want to say it's been a lifelong dream to share these inspiring moments of a friendship I will never forget. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Yes, please. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I immensely enjoyed this panel, the speakers and the panelists. I'm from the UN, I live in the end. There were two issues, unfortunately they are more serious, that I just wanted to raise before the meeting was over. Uh, the first one was in relation to Lemkin. And he was a great man and he did the just most important job that, that, is, uh, that uh, concerns humanity. Uh, the two reports, the UN Special Rapporteurs, one of them was called Wuhan Shan Kiko, I can't pronounce it very well, and the other one is uh, Benjamin um, Whiteacre. And I think they did, these two Special Rapporteurs, they did a very great job in elaborating the Genocide Convention in making it legalized, because now the, these two reports are part of the UN documents, so I think that um, I, I was wondering if your institute was some kind of studying these two reports or taking the guidelines, um, like state responsibility, protection prevention, which are included in this report. I did write a paper on that, that's why I remember. The other thing is uh, <coughs> uh, very closely related to genocidal issues. Denial and what they call now, this term has come up, but it doesn't have any legal consistency, uh, negationism. Would, you institute, would your institute uh, and your experts uh, devote some time in studying these two phenomena, their implications, their reper repercussions, fact-finding and uh, preventing genocide, all the issues dealing with genocide, and if they can finally become part of an international law framework. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? No, I, I, please go ahead. And... No, no. <clears throat> well, first of all, let me, let me choose the pretext of answering this question, to say to Nancy, what an inspirational moment this was for all of us. And let me, uh, let me pay, the, pay the finest tribute that I can to Lemkin. In your presentation, one sees the quality of his influence on it. Uh, dramatic presentation. Now, the name of the author who wrote the study on Lemkin Jacob Lawson Institute that I referred to earlier was Bill Corey, William Corey. William, yeah. On the two studies uh, that uh, our colleague mentioned here by Russian Kiko and Benjamin Whitaker. First of all, Russian Kiko did his study, he was a Rwandese and he went home and he never returned. Uh, so when Ben Whitaker, uh, uh, kind of, uh, Ben Whitaker updated his study, I would answer you in the following way if I may then. These two studies are part of an intellectual and policy journey to where we are today. Because from on the basis of these two studies, the Minority Rights Group in London and an author by the name of Leo Cooper, who has written a lot on genocide, they fought for a long time for some kind of presence at the United Nations, in the office of the United Nations Secretary General, on a focal point on genocide, first point. Secondly, the establishment of the position of special advisor on the prevention of genocide is a kind of a, a, a journey along this. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way, it's a station uh, stop along this journey. And then thirdly, I would say that the scholarly community, if I may, needs to put the role of these two special advisors much more under the under the uh, under the uh, under scrutiny to see whether or not. Diane is here, and Diane, I would just take this occasion to just add the, the following to you, which is that I think that we will not change for the foreseeable future the, the definition of genocide. The politics are such that we have to play with the convention. Uh, the International Court of Justice in the Bosnia case gave us a number of elements to play with on the duties of the state to prevent genocide. And so what I, that's why I, I think that the way to come at this issue, you frame the issue of how can you tackle it if you can't define it, if you can't say it. Uh, I think that the way to come at this is what's been said earlier. Let, let us say two things. 
the international community thinks that this is so important that every state should have in place prevention arrangements. And let, by focusing on national prevention arrangements, one comes back to the issue. So that's, uh, but I, I, I do have to end this by saying, Nancy, what a treat this has been. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Kindly ask the panelists to give the floor to the to the last comments uh, by Poland and uh, Jorgi Tatar by the foundation uh, in order to announce the prize. It would take just a few minutes, but uh, I think it's, uh, we came to the moment, very moment of uh, of the prize and how it is going to be. Okay.